Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. Welcome to day 455 and 1 Kings chapter 5. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for time to spend in your word. Thank you for the gift of life that is ours through your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you'd be with us. We pray that you'd watch over us and keep us. We pray that you would be our God, our Father, our protector, and our provider. Draw our hearts close to Christ. As we look at this preparation for the building of the temple, may we think about the reality that our lives are temples of the Holy Spirit, that we are part of the living temple of the church and see where we fit into the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 5. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram always loved David. And Solomon sent word to Hiram, You know that David my father could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversity nor misfortune. And so I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to David my father, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. Now therefore command that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. And my servants will join your servants, and I will pay you for your servants such wages as you set. For you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. As soon as Hiram heard the word of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, who has given to David a wise son to be over this great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have heard the message that you have sent to me. I am ready to do all you desire in the matter of cedar and cypress timber. My servants shall bring it down to the sea from Lebanon, and I will make it into rafts to go by sea to the place you direct. And I will have them broken up there, and you shall receive it. And you shall meet my wishes by providing food for my household. So Hiram supplied Solomon with all the timber of cedar and cypress that, that he desired, while Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20,000 cores of beaten oil. Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year, and the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon drafted forced labor out of all of Israel, and the draft numbered 30,000 men, and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. They would be a month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the draft. Solomon also had 70,000 burden bearers and 80,000 stone cutters in the hill country, besides Solomon's 3,300 chief officers who were over the work, who had charge of the people who carried on the work. At the king's command, they quarried out great costly stones in order to lay the foundation of the house with dressed stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the men of Gebal did the cutting and prepared the timber and the stone to build the house. That's First Kings chapter 5. So what we see here is very soon into his reign, Solomon has a very pressing priority. We know that David wanted to build a temple for the Lord, but the Lord told him, no, you are not going to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. And then he also told him that the son who comes after you, he will be the one to build my house. And part of why David was not allowed to build the house of the Lord, the temple, is because he was a man of war. He had shed much blood. And God is a God of peace who loves peace, and he was going to give rest to the land. And Solomon, his name, has the same root as Shalom, which is peace, it really is Shalomo uh, in Hebrew. And so he, he, has, he, he is the one who's been granted peace by God. And so since he's been granted peace and he's able to be a man of peace, he then is able to build the temple. It reminds me of... Uh, famous 
saying by John Adams who said, I must study war uh, so that my sons may study peace and diplomacy, and they must study peace and diplomacy so that their sons can study poetry and the arts and great literature. So you have to have peace first before you can have then diplomacy, which is what Solomon is here doing. So David studied war, Solomon studied diplomacy. Unfortunately, Solomon would get a little bit worldly in his diplomacy, and it would have negative consequences for himself and for the nation. But here we see the wise use of diplomacy in that he's reaching out to Hiram, the king of Tyre. Tyre is uh, a sea coastal city that is uh, north of Jerusalem along the coast. Since they're a sea coastal uh, territory, they have access to these northern forests that are to the north, the, the, the cedars of Lebanon. And so they're going to be cut down and then Tyre, uh, the Hiram, the king of Tyre, is going to send them down along the coast because that's a much, much easier way to transport large quantities of large logs. Uh, it's much easier to float them down uh, the eastern coast there of the Mediterranean than it is to try to transport them over land. You need so many beasts of burden. You need to drag them across the ground. You need to go up over mountains and valleys and, and uh, around villages. And it's just a really difficult, difficult way. So it's much easier to float them down on the water to where they would be more able to be brought straight in uh, and then up to Jerusalem. So that's what they're arranging and everything needs to be done in a way that is just, in a way that's fair, in a way that is to the benefit of both sides. So Solomon's got with this wisdom of this win-win argument, right? He's like, go oh, take Tyre, you contribute this and I'll give you food for your household and I'll also you know, make sure that I contribute to the labor as well. Our people will labor side by side. I do think we see a picture here of the building of the temple that is the church. And that is that as we reach out to new nations who come into the church, we have to respect and appreciate the contributions that they bring into the people of God. And we need to learn to work together. One of the big problems that has plagued the missionary movement over the past couple hundred years is that of sort of a Western church taking a paternalistic or even an imperialistic sort of mindset of saying, well, we're going to go and we're going to settle this place and we'll just, we'll tell them what to do and how to do it from A to Z. Uh, but there needs to be rather a, a, a desire to work together for the glory of God, according to the word of God, and yet with each side contributing their wisdom and their expertise. Uh, sometimes I think we can think we have all the answers. And so Solomon knew that there were things he didn't know well. He didn't have this kind of timber in Israel. He also didn't have people who were as skilled as the Sidonians uh, in, in cutting the timber. And so he, he needed um, the help. And so he asked for it. And this is, you know, yesterday we looked at Psalm 68 and we looked at how Christ gives to the church all these great gifts from his ascension. And part of that is he gives different areas of his church, different different parts of his church, different skills that they're good at. Uh, one of the things we do well in the PCA is theology. And the OPC does theology very well too. And if you look at the size, if you were to just look at the size of the PCA and the OPC together, let's say, you've got maybe 400, 450,000 people between those two churches, and yet the number of great doctrinally solid books that are put out, the number of conferences that are head, the number of seminary professors that come out, and it's really an, an enrichment to the church uh, to be able to provide this, this uh, systematic theology, this careful Christian scholarship and thinking about things. But we shouldn't think that we have all the answers. There's a passion, there's an enthusiasm, there's a willingness to risk that other parts of God's people have to go out and take the gospel to the nations, to go out and reach the poor neighborhoods and, and, and the hard to reach places. And of course, we in the PCA should be doing that as well, and we are, but we should recognize that different, different parts of God's kingdom have different gifts to contribute to the furtherance of the gospel. And it really should be about the gospel going forward as the gospel of Jesus Christ to build this temple that is the church to the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have a gospel to take to the nations. It cost your son his life to build this temple. He is the chief 
cornerstone because he was the first to die and rise again to eternal life. And we are all lined up to him and the apostles and prophets who form the foundation stones of this living temple. Shape us to know our place and help us to see this vision for what you are doing in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me for 1 Kings chapter 5. Tomorrow we're going to go on to chapter 6. And as always, I hope you do have a blessed day in the Lord. Mm -hmm.